my uh, GI Bill while I was in the military to buy my family a home. I say all of that to say that when I met my first partner, we played, to ba uh, played on the basketball team together, and we threw passes at each other on the basketball court <laughs> in the middle of the game. <laughs> Um, uh, he was, yeah, those kind of passes. Kind of passes. <laughs> uh, he was my partner for 11 years. And I say all of that to say that uh, when I went home, um, my family knew that Nick and I were coming, and they had a, house, a, a bed for us to, live, to sleep in. Uh, no one, they, uh, they accepted Nick, they accepted me. And my family, my mother and father, came to Newark. Uh, my father loved the Yankees, so before he passed, I took him to a Yankee ba uh, baseball game. But they met Nick's parents, and although we never had a discussion about our relationship and the fact that I was gay, I was very proud that my family accepted me. Thank and you. I still am. Going back to my years in Puerto Rico, it there is a lot. I mean, the, on, the what it makes it different in the people that I met in Puerto Rico was the fact that either here were the guy who wanted to be with me and the guy who wanted to be the friends. So the guy that wanted to be the friends, some of them to today they're gay. It's about one or two. And other one, they saw they were gay, then they were not gay, whatever that. They went into, so, but that was when I was very young. I was probably 11 and 12 at that time. And I live in a village in Puerto Rico. So when, so when you go to high school, you go to the town. It's like you go to downtown. So once you go, once you go to downtown, then you meet everybody from all of the villages because everybody goes to the same high school, and that's when you said the same person that you are in your village, when you go to high school, you see that there is so many other people that look similarly like you. And then we all bunch together, and we were united, even though we didn't know what we were doing, but we were hanging out together during the day, at night. And I think that was the first the first group of people that I believe was, we were super, supported of each other. And once I came to the United States, this is the same people that helped me to move to Connecticut. Now, when, we, when I went to Connecticut, I was able to see that regardless that I have many other friends, we're talking about, it was about 30 or 40 like me in, in Hartford, Connecticut. Everybody looking for the same thing. But regardless of, I was different than everybody else. I don't know why we will look alike, but we were all different. And that difference moved me into getting a job like many other people couldn't get a job. That difference helped me to follow my dream of having a surgery. But once I had a surgery, somebody said to me one time, we need to navigate through the world. And we have to be able to not be seen by anybody. We are women. We have behaved like women. And we have just to go like a fly, like a leaf, undetected. I think it was like that was the way to be. So that's what I did. And unfortunately, I never had the chance of a nurturing environment. I never had the chance of having a lot of other people because every time I see a person like me, we look at each other, we know who we are with each other, and everybody works their own way. Because if three of us are together, everybody knows. So if we all move around, nobody would know. <laughs> That's what I was taught to do. And then it was the fact that as much as I wanted to be part of the community, if I would go to a gay bar, people look at me funny because I didn't belong. 
I couldn't do the dance, or I couldn't do the positioning and the movement. I couldn't do that. I wanted to, but I couldn't. I couldn't go to the bar because I wanted a man, and I didn't know. I mean, it's a lot of things that are inside me, and that's what I actually did. I, I became the woman that I am. I had been, I had had my issues. I had had my problems. But I don't think that my problems are because of my sexuality. But my problems are all the problems that we have as women, as human beings, and as women. So I, I had been married. I had been married twice, going towards my third marriage. And one time, I went back to Puerto Rico after I got married in 1982, I believe. It was my first marriage. I decided to go back to Puerto Rico to the people who see me born where I grew up. I went to motor vehicle with my new driver license. You know, my name is Natalie, my son is Delbaje, and I'm a female. So here I am with my driver license. I go to my vehicle because I needed a Puerto Rican driver license. It turns that somebody from my village was working on a motor vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> and I have forget my driver license from Connecticut. So when I, go, when I came back with my driver license, I said, well, guess what? You cannot be able to get a driver license because such and such and such and such. I have learned that I need to follow the rules of the law. But I have my rights and I have my responsibilities. So if I commit to my responsibility, I better have my rights. And the day I left the surgery room in 1982, it was a, a, an attorney who signed that from this day on, you are a female and I must be respected as one. And a lot of you who knows me, a lot, of, a lot of people want to be boxed into something else. No, Natalie Evans has to be a female wherever I go because when I left the surgery room after so many years, a lawyer said, you are a female. Under the rules of this country, when I changed my name, I was thought of as female. So I do not allow absolutely nobody to tell me that I'm differently. And that's exactly what I told the people in model vehicle. All right. <laughs> so, they gave me my driver license, but three weeks ago, three weeks later, it was a private detective looking for me. Hmm. Mm. Because they have identified that my birth certificate was different. Okay. I went to a lawyer. I said, this is, this is what I have. So, well, you have to call Battle of the Statistics in San Juan. God only knows. I took all of my papers to Battle the Statistics in San Juan, Puerto Rico. In less than a half an hour, I left Battle the Statistics with a birth certificate that said that Natalie Evans was born as a female in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, I have heard so many stories about birth certificates. I have heard so many stories about social security cards. But Natalie Mason had never heard about, this is my papers. I did my responsibility to go through all of the channels to show you who I am. Give me what is mine. All right. That's all I wanted. <laughs> and believe me, if I am the person that I am today, it's because, first of all, you need to know who we are. You know to know you. And once you know you, you have a set of responsibilities to me. And once you meet that set of responsibility, I want my rights. And up to today, I made sure that my rights are taken into consideration everywhere that I go. Do I see my friends everywhere? Do I see somebody? I respect everybody. I love everybody. I wish I can be closer to this community more than what I am, because I am, is in me. But life taught me that you have to go out like a leaf and fly around, because 
what I was taught at that time, that you have to become like everybody else in America. Thank you. <laughs> well, all right, Natalie. <laughs> I'm going, to get, I'm going to shoot about three questions at you. So this one, don't think too hard. This is sort of fun, OK? Um, the first is going to be, and what, it's going to be sort of like a game. So you got to give me the answer, and then we're going to move right on. All right? What was a typical outfit for you at the age of 16? Go. Um, cut off pants, sandals, a ripped shirt with tie-dye, loads of beads, <laughs> uh, long hair. Hard as it is to believe. Uh, <laughs> tied in a braid. Um, and in the winter, a long coat that came all the way down to my ankles. Love it. <laughs> Go. I shudder. Uh, a short <laughs> skirt. <laughs> a blouse with a Peter Pan collar. <laughs> and uh, shoulder length hair. Uh, just tight pants and uh, T-shirts to <laughs> accent the positives. <laughs> A lot of makeup, short skirt, and glivage. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What was your favorite song at 16? Let's start with Natalie. Oops. You asked me to think too far. <laughs> Mm. There is not one son for me. Give me a couple. I don't, I, I don't, I don't have a son. Okay. At six. And if you can't think of songs, maybe you can think of a band or a type of music, too, that you were listening to. What type of music did you listen to? I, I, I love, I love salsa. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I guess no particular song either, but Aretha Franklin. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was always hot on my list, because she spoke to something deeper, and yeah. Remember, I grew up in the Midwest, so <laughs> uh, Northwestern Pennsylvania, half an hour from the Ohio State line, so it's Midwest. Um, country and Western music, because it was all that played on the radio. Uh, and then when my brothers came home, it was The Temptations and Aretha Franklin, because they came from New York City and brought what I now know is real music. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I do like some country and western. <laughs> oh, there's being no facetious. country western fan? No, no, I'm being facetious. Um, Tighten Up by Archie Bell and the Drell. Oh, right. <laughs> and Do the Funky Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's one more. Um, and this time I'm going to start with Marge. Mm -mm. What was your most memorable date? Oof. Mm. Good or bad? Either. <laughs> We were at Sonny's Bar. It was my senior year in high school, and I was trying to fit in. So I was dating, my small town is also a college town. So I was dating a freshman in college. And, and my, my parents were so glad I was dating, they didn't mind that he was a freshman in college and I was still in high school, my senior year. And in Pennsylvania, you had to be 21 to drink. There were only two black bars in my hometown. One was the Triple City Elks, and if you know the Elks at all, that was like bucket of blood. So I knew I better not even be seen close to there. Sonny's, I figured, was safe because it was, you know, a little more acceptable. I had a Coke. My date and the couple we were uh, double dating with were drinking and teasing me. I had the car. I had to leave to go pick up my father who worked uh, second shift at the plant, which means I had to be down there at 11 o'clock at night. I pull up, my dad comes out of the, the plant, he opens the door, and my father rarely cursed, looked at me and said, what the hell were you doing at Sonny's? And I'm but, but, trying to get it out of my mouth, I'm saying, you were at work. And in my mind, I'm saying, how in the blankety blank did you know that I was at Sonny's? Well, in the passing of folk going into the plant and folk coming out of the plant, Somebody grabbed Joe, my father, and said, your daughter was at Sonny's. So my, my, my worst memorable date 
was being grounded because I was at Sonny's, couldn't explain that I didn't drink, and had all my aunts and uncles for the next week badgering me about soiling the, the family name because uh, I was at Sonny's. Quickly, my, my best date was my first date with my partner who I met at 25. And it was really then that I really identified who I was. Um, I met her at 25. We were together for almost 25 years. And she died about 13 years ago of breast cancer. And so my best date was meeting her and having my first date with her where I could begin to really understand who I was and, and to embrace myself. Where were you, by the way? Where was I? I was in New Brunswick, um, living in New York. And I, a professor um, in my senior year at college was the first African-American professor at my small college. She moved to, and we became good friends, because uh, she took all of the black women sort of under her wing to get us through this little college in Pennsylvania. She came to Rutgers after my senior year and taught at Douglas. And when I came to New York, we would go, we would all sort of gather at her house. And she had a party, and I had met Idell, and um, I'd been talking about her. And she was about five years younger than me, and I'd, I'd said to Frida, um, the professor, you know, I've met someone, but she's five years younger, and I'm not really sure if I should do this. And Frida basically said, get a life, <laughs> and, uh, and bring her to the party. And so I brought her to, uh, to a house party in New Brunswick. Nice. James. Um, the, for me, it was uh, what I mentioned before, and that is my um, trip to, I, I was in the military, in Vietnam, and I took R and R with uh, Harold. Um, What's R and R? Uh, rest and relaxation mm -hmm. from uh, the war, and we went to Tokyo, Japan, and uh, how um, it happened that we got intimate was it started with the massage. I give great massages. <laughs> And he gave me a great massage, and <laughs> things just led to other things. And it felt like being on a honeymoon uh, the rest of the time that we were there. But of course, uh, it, it, there was only a week, so we had to go back to uh, the war. And I think that um, when I think back on it, the idea that um, I didn't know if I would survive Vietnam gave inspiration for me to act. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have acted. Thanks. Do you really want to know? Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> the most memorable life, in, uh, the most memorable experience that I have in my life is five days after my surgery, when they remove all the tubing, uh, I have to go and pee in the toilet. And because a lot of people said, well, you don't know what happened after the surgery. I don't know if you have feelings. You don't know if you don't have feelings. And when I sit on the toilet and I pee for the first time, and I feel that I was fully alive, that has been the most memorable life of my life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a hard one to find. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll I'm try. glad it's you, not me. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I'll just preface this with, uh, you know, saying um, uh, at least when I was growing up, there were strange ideas about what the cure for homosexuality was going to be. So as a very young boy, when I started to exhibit strange behavior. My father was convinced baseball was the cure. So I spent most of my childhood hitting balls with a bat. Um, uh, it did not cure me. And then the thought was going on dates with women would be the cure. So my first worst date was with Susan, who I went to high school with. And it was to go see the, it was a double date, and it was to go see The Sound of Music in Montclair. First of all, to go from Newark to Montclair was like going from Newark to Paris in those days. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and uh, I remember just feeling really weird, like it was such a strange, uh, really strange fit. And then my first date with a man, well, this was uh, my generation of gay men. You had sex first, and then you decided whether you were going to go on a date or be friends or <laughs> whatever the case was. So by the time uh, I got around to a, a, a first date, it was uh, a guest who's coming to dinner experience for two reasons. I was bringing another man home to dinner, and I was bringing a black man home to dinner. Mm. And in an Italian family in <laughs> Newark in those days, <laughs> um, that was not something one did. Um, so uh, it was, uh, and I think there was a part of me that sort of did it deliberately to provoke my, my family, frankly. <laughs> so, um, so, but, but uh, those are the two experiences that I remember. Thanks. Can you sort of paint a picture for us uh, of gay life, queer life in Newark? Um, just give us a sense of sort of what that was like for you. When, I know all of you arrived at different times. Were there clubs and bars that you've gone to? Where did people congregate? Was there a sense of community here, entertainment? Um, a super broad question, but gay life in Newark, what was that like? What was your sort of first encounter with that? Um, oh, yes. I mean, there were all sorts of places one could go to meet other gay people. I think of what used to be called the Fairy Loop in Branchbrook Park, um, where. Used to be? You, well, it may still be that. <laughs> Um, but I remember we would all go and hang out there. There were benches we would sit on. Um, eventually, one day, I remember going, and the benches were gone. So the Essex County Park Commission had come and removed the benches. Um, and then I, I remember uh, there being, uh, other than Murphy's, uh, there was a bar up on Fifth Street called The Other World, and in fact, that was the place where we had the first meeting of the first gay organization in the Essex County area called the Organization for Gay Awareness. And um, I'm still very fuzzy on this. I don't know how this happened. I must have been about 18 or 19 years old, but I remember being taken with some friends uh, to somewhere in Newark at 2 o'clock in the morning where it, it appeared to be this kind of moving disco or party. And it was, uh, I remember uh, there was maybe three white people there, of which I was one. Um, there were loads of drag queens there, uh, uh, sex workers. Um, the music was incredible. Uh, the incense was great, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> And, um, and I remember the next thing I knew it was 11 the next morning. So, and it was fun. Uh, incense will do that for you. <laughs> um, I'm probably going to lose my lesbian credentials. Uh, gay life for me when I came in the early 80s to Newark was really non-existent. Um, my partner and I did, not, not that it wasn't here, uh, but my partner and I did most of our partying and socializing in New York. Um, that, I think, largely was because she was adamant that I ran a social service agency working with kids. And given the homophobia in the African American community, she was concerned about my reputation, um, about my job. And so most of what we did was in, was in the city. Um, I never stepped in foot in Murphy's, which I know is almost sacrilege, but, uh, but it's, it, it's my reality. Um, so my, my, my first real introduction, I guess, to gay life was I was running uh, Tri-City People's Corporation, which is still on South 19th Street. And I was living in New York. Um, and it was before we moved to Newark. And there was a person who I 
lovingly called Dora the Dyke because she was this big, strong, strapping woman. And um, short natural, very dark. And when I came in as a new director, she decided she liked me. So she took me around the neighborhood and basically said, don't mess with her, because if you do, you're going to have to answer to me. Well, if you had ever met Dora, if you had any kind of sense at all, you don't want to mess with her. So folk left me alone. So I could travel into New York, into New York City from work at 11 o'clock at night, standing out on South 19th Street and Springfield Ave, waiting for the bus. And nobody touched me. Um, Dora got married, invited me to her wedding. And I said to my partner, we've got to go to this wedding. And she's saying, you dragged me from New York City to Newark, and now you expect me to go to a gay, gay, gay wedding. Um, and she, fi you know, she finally agreed. And the wedding was at People's Choice, which is a, a bar up on the top of, of Market Street and, uh, and First Street. That's First, 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 choice. first choice. I'm sorry, First, first choice. choice. It was First, first choice. choice. Yeah, thank you. First choice. It's okay. Um, and that was my first introduction to the gay life in, in Newark. I went to a gay wedding, and Dora had a tux on, and her bride had a gown on, and a minister married them, and then we partied at First Choice. When, when was that, by the way? That probably would have been 82, 83, probably. Yeah, in the 80s. Yeah, yeah it was in the 80s, yeah. Yeah, Bernie would know. <laughs> 80s, right? <laughs> <laughs>